Simenon's Maigre, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. Take a look at this, Georges. I found it at the bottom of a drawer. <laughs> Do you recognize anyone? Among these shining morning faces, no. I take it one of them is you. In the Lycée Bonville, my old school. I'm uh, second from the left, third row. That rather solid, serious little boy. <laughs> yes, Jules, I can see the resemblance now. Who's that pulling a face at the back? Hmm? Oh, him. <laughs> the clown of the school. Léon Florentin. Not the man who... Yes, that one. Your old school friend. He was nothing of the sort. He thought he was, though. Oh, yes, he thought he was. The damn. Morris Denham as Jules Maigret... Michael Goff as Georges Simenon and John Moffat as Léon Florentin in Maigret's Boyhood Friend. Léon Florentin, the confectioner's son from Moulin. Yes, the family had a nice little business. You didn't keep in touch with him after you left? No. I bumped into him once, 20 years on, looking very dashing with an elegant redhead on his arm. His wife, he said. I remember they had a pale green sports car. But that wasn't the last you saw of him. Unfortunately, no. On a sweltering summer day, 20 years later, he turned up again. Léon Florentin. Antique dealer. Yes, sir. How old is he? About your age. Tall and thin? That's right. Very tall and thin, uh, with a regular mop of grey hair. Ah, that's him. All right, send him in. Inspector Maygray will see you now. Oh, thank you. All right. Hello. How are you, Maygray? Oh, I'm well. Uh, do sit down. How's your wife? Um, my wife? Hmm. The, oh, you mean Monique, the little redhead? Yeah. Uh, she wasn't my wife. No, we just lived together for a time. No, you're not married. Then. Well, what would be the point? I say, I like your office. <laughs> I didn't expect to see such good furniture at police headquarters. So you're an antique dealer now? In a manner of speaking, yes. I buy old furniture and do it up. You know how it is. Everyone's an antique dealer mm. these days. You're doing all right, are you? Oh, yes, yes. Everything's fine. At least it was fine until this afternoon. And what happened? The, the sky fell. Oh, go on. It's hard to explain. That's the trouble. Um... Look, I'd better tell you that I have a woman friend for four years now. Uh, you've lived together? Uh, not exactly, no. She has her own place. Her name is José. Well, actually, her name is Josephine Pape, but she prefers to be called José. She's 34, but you never think it. Mm. Whew, it's hot in here. Mm. Well? I'm not the only one. The only what? I'm not her only friend. Oh, she's a marvellous girl, really, and I'm everything to her. You know, lover, friend, confidant. Yeah, but has she many other friends? Well, there's Paré and Courcel, then there's a chap over the limp called Victor, and uh, Ginger, a youngster. Hmm. So where do you come in? I go there when she's alone. You sleep there? Every night except Thursdays. What happens on Thursdays? That's Courcel's night. He lives in Rouen, but he's got business premises in Paris. Oh. Now you've despised Look, I've never despised anyone in my life. It's a delicate situation. Mm, I don't see that. But you have my solemn word. José and I love each other. Or rather, I should say, loved each other. Are you saying you've broken with her? No. Is she dead? Yes. When? This afternoon. I swear it wasn't me. How did she die? She was shot. By who? I don't know. Where did it happen? In her flat, in the bedroom. And where were you? In the cupboard. What? Well, well, you see, whenever I was there and the bell rang, I... You, oh, don't despise me. It wasn't like that. I, I work for my living. I earn... Lola, tell me exactly what happened. Well, we, we had lunch together. She's a marvellous cook. Yes, and, and she was expecting her Wednesday visitor, but not before 5.30 to 6. Mm, who was it? Francois Paré. He's a civil servant in his early 50s in charge of waterways at the Ministry of Works. Anyway, at half past three, the bell rang and I... 
got into the cupboard. Mm. No, no, it's a sort of closet, really, you know, in the bathroom, not the bedroom. And what then? I'd been in there about a quarter of an hour when I heard a sound like a shot. At the time, I thought it must have been a car backfiring. I waited for the man to go. You knew it was a man? Well, no, but I assumed it. Uh, how did you know when he'd gone? I heard footsteps leaving and the door shut. What time? About four. So the murderer stayed for about a quarter of an hour after he killed her. What? How would you make that out? Well, you said the bell went at half past three. You heard the shot a quarter of an hour later. Oh. Oh, yes, I suppose he must have done. Mm. When you went into the bedroom, where did you find her? On the floor by the bed. Did you call a doctor? No, she was dead. Did you ring the local police? No. Well, look, it's well after five. What have you been doing for the last hour? I was stunned. I just sat there. Well, eventually I pulled myself together. I, I went into a bistro and had three large brandies. And um, then there I remembered that you were the big white chief of the CID. Mm. So I came here. I, I thought you'd know what to do. Uh, did you keep any money in the flat? Oh, she may have done. She, she didn't trust banks. The witness they call her Paré, is it? Yes. Well, normally he'd be arriving at the flat about now. That's right. Has she a key? None of them had keys. Had you a key? Oh, that's quite a different matter. My dear fellow. Now, don't call me your dear fellow. All right. I'd better have a look. Let's get going. So he landed his problem in your lap. Yes. The years hadn't been very kind to him, and though he irritated me, I couldn't help feeling sorry for him. I guessed that he'd lived off Jose for years. He was lucky to find her. Indeed he was. And now she was dead. And I'm pretty certain he was wondering what the hell was going to become of him. Where was the flat? Uh, in the Rue Notre-Dame de Lorette. Downstairs was a mountainous concierge, a really enormous woman. She stared at us without expression and without any apparent interest. The flat itself wasn't what I expected. What did you expect? Oh, something less fussy, less old-fashioned. The dead woman was a plump little brunette. She had been quite attractive. Well, the doctor and the forensic boys arrived and started work. The examining magistrate came and went, and I slipped downstairs to talk to the concierge. I'd like to ask you some questions, madame. What about? Oh, I take it you haven't heard. Mademoiselle Pape is dead. Is that what all the coming and going's about? Yes. Now, may I have your name? Why? It's not your business. I have to include it in my report. Madame Blanc. Widow? No. Does your husband live here? No. Did he desert you? Yes. Nineteen years ago. I see. Now, did you see anyone go up to Mademoiselle Pape's flat between half past five and six? Yes. Who? Her Wednesday regular. Was he up there long? No. Did you see him or anyone else go up earlier in the day, about half past three? No. No one. Hmm. Did anyone come down? Not until half past four. Who? That fellow. The one who was with you. Do you know your tenant's other friends? <laughs> Is that what you call them? Oh, well, visitors, then. How many of them are there? Uh, one, two, four. Not counting that fellow. Did any of them ever meet? Not that I know of. I have to tell you that Mademoiselle Pape was murdered. Well, it was only to be expected, wasn't it? Well, have you seen our piece of monumental masonry? Huh? The concierge, that's what I call her. I shudder to think what she calls me. Uh, that fellow. Oh, so I'm that fellow, am I? She can't stand me, you know. Are you sure you told me everything? Why should I lie? Mm, you always were a liar. You lied for the fun of it. Oh, that was 40 years ago. You don't seem to have changed much. You surely don't imagine I killed her. Well, why not? But you know me. I've seen you once in the last 40 years. Why should I have killed her? What's that old witch downstairs been saying? She didn't see anyone else go upstairs. She's lying. Maybe. No, well, come on. Where? I want to look at your flat. Where is it? Boulevard Rochechoua. I'm sorry about the mess. <laughs> All looks a bit sordid, doesn't it? But I was only here on Thursdays. Have you been in this business long? Three years. 
You surely didn't expect to sell any of this stuff. It isn't worth a sou. What did you do before? Uh, I was in exports. Exporting what? Oh, a little of everything. Chiefly to the emergent countries of Africa. Oh, I see. Now, who was José's Thursday caller, the one who stayed the night? Fernand Courcel. He and José were friends long before I met her. He can't get away as often as he no, used to... No, just a minute. What's that up there on the wardrobe? What? Oh, uh, uh biscuits. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's certainly a biscuit tin. Are you fond of biscuits? I like one occasionally. <laughs> Hundred franc notes. Those are my savings. It's packed tight. I didn't know you were so thrifty. There were two biscuit tins of the same make in José's flat. Ah, I dare say that's where I got it. And I dare say that's why you waited an hour before coming to see me. You stole this money and came here. Oh, what was I to do? She had no family and I was on my beam ends. José would have wanted me to have it. But I didn't kill her. I swear it. I truly was hiding in the clothes closet. <sighs> Come along. Where, where now? Quai des Orfèvres. You're arresting me. No, I'm not arresting you. Move. It's a very odd feeling being in this situation with an old school friend. Mm, it certainly is. Uh, you, you think I'm a slob, don't you? No, I'm not judging you. I'm trying to understand. I loved her. Yes, you said so. Oh, I know we weren't Romeo and Juliet. Uh, I don't quite see Romeo skulking in the clothes closet. You don't understand. Look, did you know where she kept her money? She made no secret of it. She trusted me. Now, why should I kill her? I well, suppose she was tired of it. She wasn't. We were saving to buy a house together. Look, put yourself in my place. God forbid. What? Hmm? No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Have you got a revolver? Jose had an old one. I found it three years ago in a chest I bought at an auction. She kept it in the drawer of her bedside table. Was it loaded? Yes, she was a nervous type. I thought it would reassure her. Well, it isn't there now. I know. I looked for it. Why? Well, oh, uh, yeah, it, it was stupid, I know. I, I behaved like an idiot. I just blurt everything out. That's my trouble. Well, answer my question. Why were you looking for the revolver? To get rid of it. It was my gun, you see. I thought it was bound to get me into trouble. Yeah. You don't believe me, do you? Am I under arrest now? No. Where are you going from here? I don't know. I suppose I'd better keep away from Jose's flat. Oh, good heavens. You weren't thinking oh, no, of... No, 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 no. I, I suppose that w wouldn't be the thing. Hmm. Oh, well, it'll have to be my own place. It isn't very comfortable. Mm. Excuse me, will you? I won't be a moment. Well, I point. Yes, Chief. I've got a man in my office, tall and thin, my age, but rather the worse for wear. He lives at the end of a little alley in the Boulevard Rochechoua. Ah. I don't know what he'll do when he leaves here, but I don't want you to let him out of your sight. Hmm. Does it matter if he knows he's being followed? Well, it's not all that important. But he's as cunning as a wagon load of monkeys and he's sure to be on the lookout. Right, Chief. I'll see to it. Let me ask you something. At this point, if it had been anyone else, would you have arrested him? I'd rather not answer that. I won't pursue it. So you got on the track of the other lovers? Yes, obviously I had to interview them all. I wasn't looking forward to it. In fact, I wasn't looking forward to anything to do with this case. Oh, it's a wretched business. What is it, Jules? A murder? Yes, a shooting. Mm. The woman's dead. The trouble is, I was at school with the fellow who lived with her, and now he's up to his neck in this ghastly mess. Now, what motive? Jealousy? Mm, no, not if he did it. Did he? God knows. Ah, that may be Le Pointe. I asked him to ring me at home. Megre. La Pointe here. Hmm. There have been developments. Yes? He spotted me before we were even out of the building. Turned round and winked at me when we were going downstairs. Oh, well. Where did he go? To the Place Dauphine. Then he actually came up to me and said he was going for a drink... And would I like to join him? <laughs> what did you say? Oh, I said I didn't drink on duty. I felt a bit of a fool. Well, anyway, he downed four brandies, then he walked out into the Pont Neuf. I was quite close behind him, but I couldn't stop him. It all happened too quickly. What did he? We jumped into the Seine. Oh, God. Oh, it's all right. He came up a couple of yards from a boat, and the boatman hauled him in. 
by now there was quite a crowd and one or two policemen, so I laid low. Uh, I hope I did the right thing. Absolutely the right thing. I may tell you that Florentin was far and away the best swimmer in the school. Mm. Now, what happened next? Oh, they marched him into the police station. He came out after a bit and took a taxi back to his place. Mm. Well, go on keeping an eye on him and uh, good luck. Sit down, Inspector. Oh, thank you. I, I was expecting you. You've seen the morning paper, Monsieur Parry? Yes. Uh, thank you for coming to the Ministry yourself and sparing me the indignity of a visit to police headquarters. Well, I'm as anxious as you are to avoid publicity. Uh, had you known Josephine Pape long? About three years. Are you married, Monsieur Parry? Yes. Uh, lately, my home hasn't been very happy. My wife is a sick woman. I, uh, she suffered from a psychiatric disorder. It strained our relationship a good deal. I see. What were the circumstances of your first meeting with Josephine Pape? It was in a brasserie in the Boulevard Saint-Germain. I often stopped there for a drink. There was this young woman at the next table. She was writing a letter and having trouble with the café pen, so I lent her mine. And then? But that was all. She wasn't there the following day. The day after that, I saw her again and we chatted. Things went on like this for more than a month. I began to look on her as a friend. And at last, I went back to Jose's flat. On a Wednesday? Yes. I'm on the committee of a charitable organisation which meets every Wednesday. It was the only day I could go home late without arousing my wife's suspicion. Did Mademoiselle Pape tell you anything about her family? Yes. She came from Poitiers. Her father was killed in the war when she was a child. He was an officer in the regular army. She had one brother. Did you ever see him? Yes. One Wednesday I arrived early and he happened to be at the flat. And was he tall and thin with light grey eyes and an unusually mobile face? Why, yes. Do you know him? Mm, I've met him. Did Mademoiselle Pape lead you to believe you were her only lover? <sighs> It's not a word either of us would use. Yes, we were lovers, but that wasn't the real bond between us. We were both uh, lonely people. We opened our hearts to each other. In other words, we were friends. She was very important to me. You might say I, I lived for Wednesday evening. So you would have been shattered to find she had another lover? It would have been the end. Of what? The happiness I'd known for the last three years. A modest enough share in a lifetime. Did you never meet anyone else in the flat? Only once. Red-haired young man, an insurance agent. Josie told me he was pestering her to take out a life assurance policy. She showed me his card. Jean-Luc Baudard of the Continental. I take it you went to the flat yesterday? Yes. There was no reply, so I came away. You weren't at the flat between three and four? No, I never left the office. My staff will confirm that. Though, naturally, I, I prefer my name to be kept out of it. Realised you'd be bound to find out about me from the concierge or from her brother. Uh, she has no brother, Monsieur Parry. What? I'm very sorry to disillusion you, but you'll have to know sometime. His name is Leon Florentin. He practically lived in the flat. But he made himself scarce when visitors were expected. Uh, did you say visitors? And there were four of you, not counting Florentin. I, I, I don't believe it. You, you've made a mistake. No, I'm afraid there's no mistake. You didn't know her. She was so sane, so serene. I, I'd have trusted her with my life. No, no, Inspector, it's incredible. Did she... Did she suffer much? No. Death was instantaneous. God be thanked. I very much appreciate your discretion, Inspector. I only wish we'd met in happier circumstances. So do I, Monsieur Parry. Poor fellow. Yes, his Indian summer, with all it had meant to him, had come to a sudden shocking end. When I got back to the office, I saw there were two people in the waiting room. One was Léon Florentin, and the other was a small, rosy little man who looked like a chubby, middle-aged baby, Fernand Corcel, José's Thursday man. 
Come in, Monsieur Corsell. Uh, please sit down. Oh, thank you. Now, this must have come as a terrible shock. <laughs> yes. Why, well, I'm sorry. You see, she, she was much more than a friend. I know. Monsieur Corsell, did you know the man who was talking to you in the waiting room? Why, that's Jose's brother. Didn't you know? When did you first meet him? Three years ago, soon after he got back from Uruguay. Uruguay? I see. Had he been there long? Uh, some time. He, he's an architect. He went there on a government contract to build a new town. Mm, and you met him in Josephine Pape's flat? Yes, that's right. When you arrived unexpectedly early? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. Oh, but what are you getting at? Did you see him again? Uh, yes, he called on me at my office. He had a scheme for developing the coastline between Le Gros du Roi and Palava as a luxury seaside resort. But unfortunately, I couldn't help him. I have no capital of my own. My brother and I own the business jointly, but I gave him a few thousand francs to register the plans. Mm. What was he saying to you just now? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's rather a painful subject. Oh, well, I, I better tell you. He's a bit in the dark about his sister's finances, and he's invested every penny he has in this project, so naturally he's short of ready cash. He asked me to help with the funeral expenses. Mm. <laughs> really, Inspector, I fail to see anything amusing in that. Well, forgive me. Now, I have to tell you that his name isn't Pape. Hmm? He's Léon Florentin, and he was a school with me. You, you, you mean he isn't her brother? No, no relation. He was living with her. No, no but that, that, that's impossible. Jose was incapable of such a thing. Sit down, Monsieur Corsell. Oh, I've known her for ten years. Before I was married, we lived together. I found that flat. Where did you meet her? Well, I... Uh, in a nightclub in Montmartre. She was a hostess, but she wasn't like the other girls. She wore a simple black dress and very little makeup. She seemed shy. You spent the evening with her? Yes, she told me about her childhood in La Rochelle. What? La Rochelle. Hmm. Her father was a fisherman. He was drowned at sea. She had four young brothers and sisters to support. Yes, and what about her mother? Dead, too, I've no doubt. Yes. W what do you mean? Well, I'm sorry, but it's all a pack of lies. Oh, I can't believe it. I, I, I was passionately in love with her. And yet you got married. I, I married my cousin. It was expected. I meant to break off with Jose, but I found I couldn't. Oh, when I think of that man... Uh, he wasn't the only one. What? Three other men visited her regularly. No. Oh, no. Look, I, I'm sorry. I'd like to have spared you this, but oh. I have to find the man who killed her. That can't be done without bringing the truth out. Oh. Now, I must ask you to take a grip on yourself and... Tell me where you were between three and four yesterday afternoon. In my car on the way from Rouen. You can't mean... You suspect me. No, it's purely a routine question. I may tell you all you've said is in the strictest confidence, and if I can, I'll keep your name out of it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Florentin, you're more of a scoundrel than I thought. I know. <laughs> Now, what are you doing here? Guess how much money I've got. Fifty centimes. Nothing else in the world. Well, what has that got? Have you come here to ask me for money? Who else can I turn to? Mm. I'm destitute. I'll have to try and get a job somehow. Now, remember, you can't leave Paris. So I'm still under suspicion. Until we get the man who did it. Now, can you think of anything about the man with the limp? Oh, even José only knew his first name, Victor. Mm. He was prosperous-looking, you know, good suits and handmade shirts. Oh, yes, I've remembered something. Oh, what? She once saw a railway season ticket in his wallet. Mm. Paris Bordeaux. Ah. You see, that's worth something, isn't it? Uh, a hundred francs. And you'd better make it last. It took a hell of a time to trace him, and I hope to God I've got the right man. His name's Victor Lamotte. Oh, well done, jean -Vier. Who is he? He's a man of some standing in Bordeaux. <laughs> he took a very high-handed line with me at first, but eventually he agreed to come and see you. He'll be here in a quarter of an hour.
I'm sorry to have put you to the trouble of coming here, Monsieur Lamotte. You know what I want to see you about? Oh. You knew Josephine Papé. How did you find out? We have our sources of information. Josephine Papé was murdered in her flat yesterday afternoon. Where were you? Not there, at any rate. Were you in your office? No, I was taking a walk in the Grand Boulevard. Alone? Oh, what's so strange in that? My doctor has urged me to take regular exercise. You realize it leaves you without an alibi? Do I need one? As one of José's lovers, yes. I see. Were there many of us? Four. Not including the man who lived with her. So she had a man living with her, did she? I believe your day was Saturday. I'm a creature of habit. I visited José on Saturday and then caught the Bordeaux Express. Are you married, Monsieur Lamont? Yes, a grown-up family. How long have you known Josephine Papé? Four years. What did she mean to you? Uh, she provided uh, relaxation. Had you any affection for her? That's too strong a word. Perhaps I should say liking. Uh, she was a pleasant companion, and I believed her to be discreet. <laughs> I'm surprised you were able to crack me down. We knew you had a limp and a railway season ticket. I see. Where did you first meet Jose? On the train, in the restaurant car. We sat at the same table. She, uh, she seemed a very respectable sort of woman. Had you a mistress at that time? What did you say your name was? Well, it's of no importance, but if you must know, it's Maigret. Well, Monsieur Maigret, I did have a mistress. Just a week before I met Jose, she announced that she was going to be married. In other words, there was a vacancy to be filled. I don't care for your tone. How long had you known Jose when you first went to her flat? Three weeks. Did she tell you where she came from? Yes, Grenoble. Hmm. Did you make her a generous allowance? That is a most indelicate question. Answer it, please. I gave her 2,000 francs a month in an envelope. I left it on the mantelpiece. Did you know any of her other protectors? You had hardly expected to introduce us. No, no, I didn't. Were you distressed to learn of her death? Uh, to be honest, no. Millions of people die every day. Do uh, you want a signed statement from me? No. If it should come to trial... It will. Always supposing you get the murderer. We'll get him. I'd better warn you, I shall take steps to keep my name out of it. I have influential friends. No, I don't doubt it. Goodbye, Monsieur Lamotte. Oh, I was glad to see the back of him. He disgusted me. A cold-blooded bastard, yes. So, three down and one to go. You still had to see Ginger. Yes, Jean-Luc Baudin at the Continental. I traced him through his firm. jean Vier was keeping an eye on his hotel, and he reported that Baudin had just gone back to his room with a woman. So I went straight round. I'd like a word with Monsieur Baudin. It's urgent and private. Uh, who are you? Chief Inspector Maigret, police. Uh, uh, do I have to come with you? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not alone. I want to ask you a few questions. Yeah, all right. Come in. Thank you. <laughs> you want me to go, I suppose? Uh, yes, uh, you'd uh, better wait for me in the brasserie. Um, you have come about poor Jose. Yes. How long have you known her? Oh, about a couple of months. How did you meet her? I called at her flat. I'm an insurance agent. Was she alone? No, there was a man with her, a bit of a layabout, tall and thin. He made himself scarce. Mm. You sell life insurance, I believe. Accident policies as well, and other things. Were you able to address Mademoiselle Pape? <laughs> Not in the sense you mean, but, uh, well... She was a tidy little armful, and uh, I had the feeling she fancied me, so I had to go. <laughs> well, sometimes you get your face slapped, but it's always worth a try. Mm, was it worth a try with her? <laughs> I'll say. How often did you see her afterwards? I wasn't counting. What do you know about her? She told me she was born in Dieppe. She told you the truth. 
Hmm? She was. Oh, she, uh, told me about the others. She was a bit scared of the one with the limp. And a bit irritated by the grey-haired one. He wanted to marry her. Did he? Yeah. She said, you'd think he owned me. If I'd wanted to, I could have stepped into his shoes, but I didn't. I wanted out. She was getting too keen. I was... I was trying to end it. Gently. Do you think he killed her? I've no idea. Any one of them could have done it. What were you doing yesterday afternoon? You want to know if I've got an alibi? Sorry. <laughs> I haven't. Well, thank you. That's all for the moment. Yeah, good. Oh, um, I say, would you mind uh, looking in on the brasserie on your way down, giving the dolly bird the green light? Hmm? <laughs> Tell her I'm waiting. I don't feel like getting dressed. <laughs> Did you? Yes, actually. She was so surprised she couldn't think of anything to say. I've never been given a job like that in my life. Why did you do it? Because I rather liked him. He was a refreshing change from Victor Lamotte. Anyway, I'd seen them all now and heard their stories. I thought about it for a long time. And I decided that the key to it all was with that woman. The concierge? That's right, the monolithic concierge. So, after interrogation... Confrontation. Yes. I summoned them all to my office. And the concierge. But Janvier held her in reserve. Gentlemen, you can be in no doubt why you're all assembled here. Josephine Pape is dead, and one of you killed her. I protest. Keep your protest till later. I have accused no one. All but one of you denies setting foot in the flat on Wednesday afternoon. But not one of you has an alibi. I have. No, Monsieur Paré, yours won't do. Your office has a second door. You could have got out that way without anyone seeing you. <clears throat> now, I have to tell you all that when Josephine Pape was killed, she was not alone in the flat. The murderer? The murderer, of course. But somebody else was there, too. When the bell rang at half past three that afternoon, Léon Florentin was there. He hid in the clothes closet, as he'd done in the past. After a quarter of an hour, he heard a shot. But he was too scared to come out till he heard the murderer leave the flat. A quarter of an hour later. Now, that's important. Why the delay? Perhaps he was looking for something. Yes, he was looking for something. Monsieur Paré, did you ever write to Mademoiselle Pape? Yes, when I was on holiday away from Paris. Your wife is a sick woman. I'm sure you would go to great lengths to spare her pain. And you, Monsieur Lamont, did you ever write to her? Yes. Your wife is rich, your family well known in Bordeaux. Monsieur Corsell? Oh, well, I uh, may have scribbled a note or two. You too are married. Yeah, but I'm not. No. You could have an altogether different reason for killing her. What? Blackmail. The letters have vanished. There was nothing in her desk but bills. Now, I'm not inviting a confession, but one of you knows who killed José. I hope he will come and see me. Well, La Pointe? Sir? Fetch Jean Vier, will you? Yes, sir. You certainly don't pull your punches. This is an outrage. Now, oh, come in, Madame Blanc. I think you know all these gentlemen. I still have nothing to say. Let me go. Now, which of these men did you see going up to Josephine Pape's flat on Wednesday? You refuse to answer? I have nothing to say. You can't frighten me. Very well. Well, gentlemen, I'm grateful to you all. For those who are interested, Josephine Pape's funeral will take place tomorrow morning. The hearse will set out from the forensic laboratory at ten o'clock. So you left them to stew a bit. That's exactly what I did. For by now, Georges, an idea was stirring in my mind. I'd had another look at the photographs taken in José's flat, and something had struck me very forcibly. I thought I knew what had happened now, but I still didn't know who the murderer was. And then, on the Saturday of José's funeral, things started to come to a head. The concierge disappeared. Who was supposed to be shadowing her? Oh, Lord, he poor devil. 
She went shopping, and he waited outside an Italian grocer's for her. When she didn't come out, he went inside and found it had a back door. She'd been blackmailing the murderer, of course. Of course. And when I brought her face to face with them all in my office, she looked at one, and she saw in his face that she could get much more out of him. So she went to collect it. I got a search warrant. I reckon that might yield something. At one o'clock, Lorty telephoned to say that she was back at her post. So Lapointe and I went straight round. You won't find anything. Won't we? There's nothing to find. Hope you're tidying up after you. You're making a great deal of mess. No, your post office book, madam? Yes. Anything wrong in that? No, nothing that I can see. Any luck, Laporte? No, sir. Nothing. Mm, I haven't. Oh, just a moment. What are you doing? Leave that set alone. You'll upset the tuning. No, we're not doing any harm to your television, madam. What's in this magazine on top of it? What do you expect? Just the programme. Now, there's something inside. Yeah. Huh. 2,000 francs. What is this, madam? I'm entitled to my savings, aren't I? You have a post office book. I've just looked at it. I might need ready cash. Well, that's quite a lot of ready cash. Well, that's my business. I'm not a thief. No, I'm not suggesting you are. I don't even think you asked for this money. I think the murderer offered it to you. You know who he is. I have nothing to say. Yesterday you realised he was a frightened man. You went to ask for more. I'm saying nothing. Beat me up if you like. Oh, thank you, but I'd rather not. Come on, Lebois. I'll see you again, madame. Damn her. Damn her. How can I get that frightful woman to talk? Chief. Uh, I have a notion Florentine knows something, too. And uh, he's much weaker than she is. I've been trying to put the pressure on him. Well, he's lying. I've known that for some time. Well, then. Yeah, you're right. I've been chipping away at a rock when there's something much more brittle available. This place is beginning to feel like home. <laughs> you didn't half rattle them yesterday. Why did you send for me? To show you this photograph, José's bedroom, just after the murder. What am I supposed to be looking at? The bed. There isn't a crease on the counterpane. Now, you said José and her murderer went into the bedroom and spent a quarter of an hour there. Well, obviously, it wasn't for the usual purpose, so what were they doing? Well, maybe they meant to go to bed and then quarrelled. Or he wanted his letters back. And Florentin. Yes? There's something wrong with your story. Did you take those letters? No, I swear I didn't. Why did you take a sudden dive into the Seine? I... I, I, I my only thought was to end it all. Oh, rubbish. You're an excellent swimmer. And I think you took the letters when you took the money. You still had them on you when you saw Le Pointe following you and you panicked. You realised you were going to be watched continuously. So you jumped into the Seine and ditched. I never had the letters. I give you my word. Mm. Your word's not worth much. You've got it in for me. Why should I have it in for you? Because you were always jealous of me. Because my family owned a nice little business in Moulin. Your father was just an upper servant on the Chateau de Saint Fiacre estate. You ba Gosh, you're despicable. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologise. Mm. No, I, I lost my head. Oh, Amigre, please, for, for old time's sake. For old time's sake, indeed. Oh, look at yourself, man. What's to become of you? You're a miserable wreck, Florentin. Well, everything went sour on me. I've been unlucky. But if I get a chance... You're I... still hoping, but what for, for heaven's sake? I don't know. Right, that's settled. And now the time's come to take a weight off your mind. I know you didn't kill José, huh? but your story is a pack of lies. No, uh, I can Now, be quiet. The doorbell rang, certainly, but you didn't hide in the clothes closet. You bolted into the bedroom. José and her caller were in the sitting room. You heard his voice and you were terrified because you knew he hadn't come to see José. He'd come to see you. Why? Why should he? Oh, she was he was going to chuck you out. You knew she'd fallen in love with Boda. So, you looked around for another source of income. You tried to blackmail one of José's lovers. How did you know? I didn't. Till yesterday. Now, 
Are you going to tell me the rest of the story? I suppose so. You know it all anyway. Oh, yes, I know it all. <laughs> he found me hiding in the bedroom and dragged me out, shouting abuse at me, with her there listening. He was furiously angry. I wouldn't give him back his letters. He opened the table drawer and pulled out the revolver. José screamed. I, I was terrified. I'll show you hid behind her. Well, I, I hardly knew what I was doing. Now, I, I swear to you, it was an accident that the gun went off. And I believe that. He, he didn't know anything about guns. I mean, you could see that. I was actually on the point of giving him back his blasted letters when the thing fired. And José fell dead. He panicked and rushed from the room. Has he still got the revolver? I suppose so. So you left with José's savings and the letters. You came to me because you're a coward and you thought I'd protect you. Will I be charged with anything? Well, that depends. On whom? On the examining magistrate. And, to some extent, on me. I could only survive a year or two in jail. I've got heart trouble as it is. He's here, Chief. Hmm? With his lawyer. No, send him up. Who? The murderer. What, you know which one it is? Yes, I know which one it is. The concierge talked? No, but she did the next best thing. What do you mean? On Saturday, she disappeared. We knew she'd gone to blackmail the murderer. She turned up again later, but wouldn't say a word. And suddenly, I realised that I knew. How? How could you? Well, she went to find the murderer on a Saturday. Now, she wasn't the woman to forget the day. She wouldn't make that mistake. But on Saturdays, most offices are shut. Most men are home with their wives. On that particular day, there was only one of José's lovers she knew she could find. Yes. That's the one. Yeah. He wasn't at home with his wife. He was always in his Paris office on Saturday because he was José's Saturday caller, the man with the lip. Victor Lamont. The concierge talked, didn't she, in the end? In the end, yes. Now, Lamont got off lightly. After all, it was pretty much an accident. What happened to Florentin? Oh, God knows. Perhaps in twenty years' time, some shambling old wreck will wink at me from the gutter and I'll recognize my old school friend. Think of it, in 40 years, I hadn't set eyes on a single one of the boys who'd been my schoolmates at the Lycée Bonneville. And when at last I did, of all people, it had to be Florent.